Hi everyone, welcome to the October edition of the Comsoc seminar. Uh, we have two fantastic speakers with us today, uh, Nicholas Day and Jamie Tucker Fords, and uh, they are uh, going to talk uh, talk to us about uh, some some very interesting social choice problems. So first, we are going to have Nicholas, who is going to tell us about temporal elections, welfare, strategy proofness, and proportionality. Nicholas, the floor is all yours. Right. Um, everyone. Um, so thanks, thanks to the organizers and the uh, and, and Dominic for having me here today. Um, so so did it. Okay, let me. You can't see the um bar at the side, right? It's not covering anything. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, today I'll be talking about um temporary elections uh, with a focus on welfare, strategy, proofness, and proportionality. Uh, and this is joint work with uh, my supervisor, Edith Elkin at Oxford, uh, and with Zhe Yuan from A-Star Singapore, who's, I think, here in the chat as well. Um, yeah. Okay, so um, let's begin with a short motivating example. Um, suppose you meet some friends at a week-long conference in Spain, um, and you know the conference doesn't provide lunch or dinner, or maybe they do, but you're just not happy with the food served there, right? So you decide to go to the city center for some food. And of course, there are many uh, restaurant options available uh, and many cuisines to choose from as well. Yeah, um, but people, uh, including the people in your group, um, often have differing uh, preferences on the type of food they like to eat, right? So, so for simplicity, we provide sort of options only over cuisines and suppose preferences are as follows, right? So 50% so of the group like Spanish food, 35% like Japanese food, 10% uh, likes American food, and the rest like uh, British food. Yeah, um, and if you are like deciding where to go for a meal, um, you will want to do some form of you know preference aggregation to ensure some fair outcome, right? And of course, uh, a very natural and probably the one of the fairest uh, solution by some metrics in this case, uh, would be to select the majority preferred outcome, right? So in this case, Spanish food, uh, which would satisfy um fifty percent of the group, right? And, and this is fine if you're making a single decision, right? Um, um, but what if we you know need to make this decision uh for like multiple meals or or rounds, right? Um. So, so let's consider an example where decisions need to be made over multiple rounds, right? And assume that, you know, each agent is single-minded throughout time, right? Basically having like static preferences. Um, and one way of sort of to aggregate preferences in this case is, you know, at each round, just continue to select the majority uh, supported option. But, um, but you can see that in this case, you know, 50% of the population may potentially be unhappy, right? Um, you're, you're giving all the utility to, to like half, half of the population. Uh, and we can probably construct, you know, more complicated examples where using such a rule uh, can lead to only a very small fraction of the population being satisfied at all. But, um, so, so the big question is then, right? You know, given scenarios like that, right? Can, how can we find an outcome that is fair, right? And even what, what does it mean to be fair, right? And if, we have an appropriate definition of uh, a fair outcome in this case. Um, can we then sort of find it efficiently? So, so we first define the model. Um, um, we have n agents, n projects, and l time steps. Uh, and each agent has a set of approved projects at each time step. Uh, and we also assume you know, that there are no hard constraints on which project can be chosen at each round. Uh, so all agents and all projects are available, are available at every, every time step. Um, the outcome is then a sequence of projects chosen, uh, one per time step, uh, and an agent's um, utility is basically the number of approved projects uh, he has in the outcome. Right. Our, our goal over here is then you know, to obtain some outcome, uh, a sequence of projects uh, that maximizes some welfare objective um, and or satisfies some fairness property. Right. Okay, and in this work, we consider um, three main settings, right, in, in decreasing order of generality, right? So the first one is the general setting where, you know, each, each agent has at least one uh, approved project across all time steps. Um, otherwise, it's just, a, you know, a dummy agent and we can remove him from, from the instance. Um, and the second is like uh, the complete preference setting. So, so each agent has at least one approved project at each time step, right? So, so this can be seen as like a a more restricted case, um, but it also makes sense to mandate this or, or to observe this in many cases, right? So for example, uh, in our motivating example, um, having no particular opinion on any cuisine uh, would be more reasonably interpreted as, you know, approving all options rather than having some empty approval uh, set. Okay, and, and the last setting that we consider uh, is where each agent has exactly one approved project at each time step, uh, and we call these the unique preference setting, right? So even more um, sort of restrictive. Okay, and, and there are many related works in this area under different names. Um, and many of the authors are, are, are here today, actually. Um, I just saw. Um, so beginning with perpetual voting, uh, by Martin Lechner, uh, that looks at you know temporal extensions of traditional multi-winner voting rules. Um, they they analyze a bunch of uh them with respect to some novel axioms developed for for this sequential decision making setting. 
Um, and there are also a bunch of works on um, sequential, sequential decision making uh, that look at extensions of the popular um, justified representation axioms, right, uh, and its variants. Um, and there are other works that look into like sequential committee elections where an entire committee is selected every time step. Uh, and there's a typical focus uh, to like to look at like, you know, minimizing or maximizing uh, the amount of changes in the committee, right, while maintaining some property like, you know, representation, proportionality and stuff like that. Okay, and there are also a bunch of other very related works. Like one, one example is like scheduling, uh, where some constraints are imposed on agents' preferences and the outcome, right? To be permutations over projects. Um, so each project must be selected exactly once, um, or, or like public decision making. So, um, so, so you can check out a survey that uh, we published in Triple AI earlier this year uh, for a systematic review of all the works uh, in this area and how they relate to one another um, and the many open questions and directions um, that remain in this area. Okay, so, so in this work, we consider um, two very common uh, welfare objective study and related fields, uh, mainly um, maximizing utility and welfare, uh, basically maximizing the sum of agents' utilities, uh, or maximizing it, uh, egalitarian welfare, uh, which is basically maximizing the minimum agents' utility, right? Um, then this other common welfare objective uh, that people usually look at, I think, in like public decision making and you know, like in fair location and stuff, uh, it's Nash welfare, right? Which maximizes the geometric mean or the product of agents' utilities. Um, but so so actually most or uh, although not all of our results are for egalitarian welfare would extend to that for Nash. Uh, so so for simplicity, we just won't be talking about uh, Nash and this work. Um and Okay, so yes, yeah, it's, it's easy to see that, you know, the selecting the majority supported project each time step uh, would maximize the uh, utility in welfare, right? And, and since it's a simple greedy algorithm, uh, it runs in polynomial time. Um, but um, unfortunately, the same cannot be said for maximizing uh, egalitarian welfare, right? We we show that, you know, even under the unique, the sort of the very restricted unique preference setting, uh, where each, you know, agent approves of exactly one project, uh, it is NP complete to determine if there exists an outcome. Uh, that just guarantees each agent a utility of one, right? And this basically rules out the possibility of you know maximizing egalitarian welfare in, in even like very simple settings, right? Um, so so to sort of handle this, we also consider um the complexity of egalitarian welfare maximization uh from the parameterized complexity and approximations uh algorithms perspective. Um, so, so the decision problem of, you know, determining whether, um, given a particular problem instance, whether there exists an outcome satisfying uh, egalitarian welfare um, has four natural parameters, right? The number of agents, number of projects, number of time steps, uh, and the utility guarantee uh, lambda. Right? And we show like a whole set of results with respect uh, to these um, parameters. Right. So, so for instance, um, if, for example, the number of agents is bounded by a constant, uh, which makes sense in many smaller scale real world scenarios, um, we can then, you know, maximize the egalitarian welfare in constant time. And we sort of use standard linear programming, uh, integer linear program uh, techniques um, to, to, to prove this. Okay, and, and if the number of time steps is bounded by a constant, then we can also maximize our egalitarian welfare in volume time using a very sort of simple exhaustive search. And we complement this with uh, a, like a W2 hardness proof, uh, which basically shows that, you know, an FPT with respect to the number of time steps, so is unlikely to exist. So, so even if you have, you know, your, your time steps is bounded, bounded by a constant, you are unlikely able to do this in constant time, right? So this um, slice-wise polynomial um, guarantee is sort of quite tight. Okay, and, and for last parameterized complexity result, uh, we show that, you know, even when there are only just two projects and a utility guarantee of one uh, to each agent, uh, the problem is already NP complete. Uh, and then we, we also show that, you know, if in the complete preference setting where each agent uh, must approve of something in each time step, um, and uh, when there are only two projects, and if the utility guarantee is bounded by a constant, uh, we can do it in polynomial time. Right, so, so, yeah, we can see it's like quite restrictive uh, in terms of what positive results we can get. Uh, for some parameters, but for others, uh, I guess it's it's fine. Okay. Um. Okay. Yeah. So so our hardness result also basically implies that you know computing the Gaitian welfare maximizing outcome uh is inapproximable in general, right? Um. Um. And but one interesting result is that if you know we were to augment each agent's utility function by one, so so this captures settings whereby you know we have some time step where every agent approves of the same project, um then. So it makes sense sometimes, right? So, so then we can get uh, one over four log n approximation to egalitarian welfare um, in, th in this case. Okay, so, so yeah, okay, we have seen a uh, primary chest complexity results, we've seen approx an approximation algorithm in a, in a special case. Um, and we know that, you know, maximizing utilitarian welfare can be done easily. Maximizing egalitarian welfare uh, is difficult in general, but there are many instances where we can do it efficiently, right? And so that completes the sort of welfare part of, of this talk, right? And uh, the next part we want to study is the uh, compatibility of, of strategy proofness uh, together with each of these um, welfare objectives.
Right, so, so in simple terms, um, strategy proofness basically says that you know it should not be the case that an agent can misreport their utilities, um, and and strict uh in, the, in this case misreport their approval sets and strictly benefit from the new outcome um chosen by the algorithm, right um, so we we show for for this case uh, that the greed, uh, in the utilitarian welfare maximizing case uh that the greedy algorithm uh that chooses a project with the highest number of approvals at each time step right uh while breaking ties lexicographically um would satisfy this property and so that's good news okay at least we have we have uh, strategy proofness that's compatible with utilitarian welfare uh which is may not be entirely fair but it's, it's something um and we also went on to see you know would it satisfy like a stronger version of strategy proofness uh and one commonly studied uh property stronger property is called group strategy proofness so group strategy proofness says that um no group of agents should be able to lie about their preferences um so as to benefit everyone in the group right and, and this obviously implies strategy proofness um if your group is a single thing. and um but unfortunately this sort of um group strategy proofness cannot be guaranteed by the greedy algorithm that maximizes the utilitarian welfare. Um, so, so then the next question is, you know, what about um, egalitarian welfare? Right. Um, and um, well, contrastingly, we show that you know, no, in no deterministic mechanism uh, that maximizes egalitarian welfare can be strategy proof, uh, even in the complete preference setting where each agent uh, need to approve of something uh, at each time step. Right. And intuitively, this is because you know agents has an, have an incentive uh, to not report their approval for already popular projects. Right. And, and we'll we'll. Take a quick look at, at the counter example uh, that we we constructed over here, right? So so in this case, you can see that um, okay, P one should be chosen in the first time step uh, if you want to maximize the guide and welfare, uh, and we can suppose you know without loss of generality that um P one is not chosen in the second time step, right? And say that the algorithm picks P two instead, right? Um, then then in this case um. Agent one can then lie about his preference, right? And, and the algorithm will then pick. I mean, he lies and says they approve P one and P two and don't approve P one in the first time step. Um, and the algorithm will pick P1 in both time steps uh, in order to maximize the Gaetan welfare, right? You can verify that this is the Gaetan welfare maximizing. Uh, and in this case, agent one with respect to his true approval sets uh, would strictly benefit, right? So, so that's bad news uh, for Gaetan welfare. And so, so um, a follow-up question in this case, okay, we, we can't get uh, strategy proofness um, for Egalit in conjunction with Gaetan welfare even in... Uh, so restricted setting, um, can we maybe you know relax strategy proofness? Maybe maybe it's a bit too strong um, um for our case of with this welfare objective, right? Um, and so we consider a, a relaxation of strategy proofness, um, which is known as non-obvious manipulability, or, or NOM for short, right? It was introduced by Troyer and Memorial in twenty twenty, uh, and has been studied in like several multi a uh, single single round multi winner voting and fair division papers, right? So so intuitively. A mechanism is said to be norm uh, if an agent cannot increase her worst case utility or best case utility uh, with respect to her true utility function by misreporting her approval sets. When SI over here is the agent's true approval vectors and BI is like any other approval vector, right? S, S minus I is then like all possible combinations of approval vectors of like other agents. Okay. Um, and, and clearly strategy proofness implies norm, right? Because strategy proofness says that, you know, an agent should not be able to improve her utility in all cases, right? Um, but norm just consists like the two border cases, uh, best case and worst case. Um, and so we can see that norm here is actually quite a um, weak version of strategy proofness. Like it's quite a huge relaxation. Um, but unfortunately, it turns out that, you know, still even with norm, uh, it's still incompatible with egalitarian uh, welfare um, for all the domestic algorithm, uh, algorithms, um, which is quite bad. Um, but we are able to show that, you know, in the setting of uh, complete preferences where each agent must approve of at least one uh, project each time step, uh, uh, any mechanism that returns an egalitarian welfare maximizing outcome uh, with some lexicographical tie-breaking rule um, or basically in favor of agents with lower indices um, would, would satisfy norm. Right? So, so at least there's some good news over here in terms of um, the compatibility of um, welfare objectives uh, with some form of resistance to like strate strategic manipulation. Um, okay, so so that that was for um, strategy proofness and and norm manipulation in general, um, and in this sort of third part um, that we'll look at is uh, proportionality, uh, and its compatibility with our two welfare objectives, right? Utilitarian welfare and egalitarian welfare, um, and so the proportionality notion that we consider here is uh, is, is as follows, right? Um, so each agent should get a utility of at least um floor of mu over n, right? Where mu is the maximum possible utility that the agent can get, uh, if you were to control the project selected at every time step, right? Um, so you know if if someone don't approve of something at a particular time, time step, then I don't count that, right? Because um, no matter what the outcome is, he wouldn't be able to get any utility from that. 
Okay, and, and this notion is kind of equivalent to um, you know, proportionality up to one item in the fair division sense, right? Um, the flaw function is there because, you know, if you have a, like a single time step where both agents approve of different projects, uh, then it's impossible to satisfy it without the flaw function, right? Um, and one other notable thing is that our hardness proof for egalitarian welfare can also be used to show hardness of determining whether there exists an outcome satisfying proportionality without this flaw function, right? Um, so, so there are many reasons why, why we um, have this flaw function over there. Um, and we show over here that a sort of a, a simple greedy algorithm uh, can get a proportional outcome. Uh, and this is sort of similar to the uh, result in a uh, at all paper uh, in, in the case in, of uh, public decision making, right? They also show a simple greedy algorithm can get like a prop one uh, guarantee. Um, okay, but I guess more notably um, um, for those familiar with justice represent representation axioms uh, in the temporal voting setting, um, proportionality over here can be seen as a specialization of the strong PJR axiom uh, for temporal voting to um, voter groups of size one, right? And so the existence of proportional outcomes also follows from the work of uh, Chandak et al. Uh, and we discuss this connection uh, in more detail uh, in our paper. Okay. So there are many reasons as to how, uh, how this proportionality links to the stronger versions of proportionality that you typically see in, in multi-winner voting or like temporal voting. Um, and also it links to fair division. Okay, so um, now because finding some proportional outcome is, is not difficult, right? A greedy algorithm gets it. Um, one may wish to, to, you know, like select the best prop outcome, right? And, and the natural criterion over here would be to pick the proportional outcome uh, with maximum utilitarian or egalitarian welfare. When um, our previous hardness result basically implies that, you know, selecting the proportional outcome with maximum egalitarian welfare uh, is also anti-hard, right? So there doesn't seem to be uh, much hope there uh, for egalitarian welfare, uh, but maybe, you know, we can look at getting proportionality with utilitarian welfare, right? Um, it makes a utilitarian maximizing outcome slightly more fair, right? Um, or something like that. Okay, um, but unfortunately and, and surprisingly, right? Well, e even though finding a prop outcome is like easy and finding a utilitarian welfare maximizing outcome is easy, um, determining if there you know, exists a prop outcome that also has maximum utilitarian welfare uh, is hard, uh, even under complete preferences, right? So, so the idea is that you know, there may be exponentially many prop outcomes, um, and, and this basically also implies that you know, finding a utilitarian welfare maximizing outcome among all prop outcomes uh, is also anti-hard, right? Not just finding one that globally maximizes uh, utilitarian welfare. Um, and our results basically also... Uh, Review that you know proportionality while satisfiable on its own uh, is generally incompatible with um, social welfare maximization, both egalitarian and utilitarian. Um, okay, and and for this, um, the the last group of questions uh, that we consider is you know the trade off between say we still want proportionality, right? How much would we suffer in terms of welfare? Okay, um, and so we use this uh, notion of, of like the, this concept of a uh, price of fairness, right? And price of fairness has also been studied for several like uh, proportionality guarantees in single, uh, in the single round multi winner voting uh, setting and in fair division as well. Um, so so in this context, price of proportionality basically takes the supremum over all the instances, uh, and considers the ratio of the maximum welfare of an outcome for an instance, um, over the maximum outcome, uh, maximum welfare, of an outcome for an instance given that it satisfies prop. Right, so so if a welfare is not affected by mandating prop, uh, then the price is one, right, and and that is the minimum. So the higher the price is, the more welfare suffers by mandating prop, right, and we show that you know requiring requiring prop has no impact on egalitarian welfare. Um, so so any outcome we, we show that any outcome can be transformed in polynomial time, uh, into a into a proportional outcome and and with as at least as much egalitarian welfare as before. Right. And, and so the, the price of proportionality in this case with respect to egalitarian welfare uh, would be one. Okay. And in contrast, we show that you know for egalitarian welfare, uh, the price of proportionality scales uh, as square root n, right? Even when you have the even in the complete preferences setting. And um, I mean we also consider like um, like strong price of proportionality where the denominator is like a min instead of the max. And and for that we naturally show worse bounds. Um, but you can check out our paper for um further details uh, regarding that. Okay. Um. So yeah. So this work, we you know we only consider two welfare objectives: um, utilitarian welfare, egalitarian welfare, uh, and many of our results actually would for egalitarian welfare would uh, sort of translate to Nash as well. Um, but these welfare objectives fall into a broader class of welfare objectives called the uh, P mean welfare, uh, which has been looked into by several works. I think mostly in fair division. Um, but one could potentially like derive more general positive or negative results uh, for this broader class of rules, right? And we show that this, I mean, we have some like preliminary results for this, uh, is that we, we, you know, we show that this problem is x slice-wise polynomial in the number of agents, um, but all other problems related to this is, is open. 
Um, and another direction that you can consider is you know going beyond approval sets and you, know, you can consider like ranked or or agents with cardinal or numerical utilities. Um, and, but unfortunately, we know we show that um, strategy proofness and proportionality would not even be satisfiable uh, in this in in this more general setting, right? Let alone in conjunction with like welfare objectives. Uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, um, but there may be other like interesting questions to consider um, in this setting, um, apart from this. Um, but yeah, with that, I've come to the I've come to the end of my talk. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, if you want to check out um, our paper, just you can scan this. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Nicholas. Uh, that was a wonderful talk uh, and very beautiful slides, if I say so. Uh, okay, so there are a few uh, questions on the chat, uh, and I can just ask the people to to read their questions out aloud if if uh, they want to do so. I had a question, but that's uh, I, I believe is uh, satisfactorily answered. Uh, Piotr, is your are, are you satisfied with the answer to your question about FPT versus XP? Uh, I think I'm good. Yes, thank you. All right. Uh, then I had an, another question. Uh, so you kind of showed this uh, uh, the the transformation from the utility to one plus utility and how that allows achieving an approximation of egalitarian welfare. And it reminded me of the smooth Nash welfare uh, from our previous paper on on this uh, allocation of public goods. And and I wonder if this kind of transformation of one plus is more generally. I mean, there we don't didn't really think of that as the transformation of utilities, but rather just as a new welfare right. function. But it it I mean, given yep. I mean, in this light, it might feel like uh, maybe you can take any p mean welfare function and just kind of uh, plug in one plus utility in there, and some something nice right. comes out in the voting setting. Do you, do you have any any thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah, I think that um, I I think yeah, but some works also like I think there are other like works on Nash welfare where they put a one plus and things work out nicely. Uh, particularly for Nash welfare. Uh, so yeah, I think that if you if you you know consider this sort of but yeah if you consider like a this augmented utility function um then things would work out better in terms of you know whether you can achieve approximation algorithms or and get some positive result in that setting so so we haven't actually looked at you know if we were to consider this augmented um utility function for like all all the problems that we have seen so far but we just considered that for like this special case uh, because i think we it captures i mean it captures a special case but again that special case is quite realistic also right um, so so that's a possible uh, direction for like more positive results yeah perfect thanks uh, dominic you have the next question do you want to read it out about the uh, weaker fairness axiom than approximating egality all right yeah, so, so you mentioned two impossibility theorems, the parity proofness cannot be done by mechanisms maximizing egalitarian welfare. I mean, when yeah. I first saw that statement, I, my first reaction was, why is this an impossibility theorem? Isn't that just a statement about the rule that satisfies, that maximizes egalitarian welfare? I guess it's because yeah. there are ties and there's no selection of, among the ones that maximize egalitarian welfare. But still, it feels like this is a very small set from which you're choosing. And so you can think of it as an axiom that's very strong, cannot be weakened to some other fan. Right, right. Yeah. Property. I mean, I yeah, I guess the space of egalitarian welfare maximizing mechanisms we look into is like when you know you tie break in any way, you still can't get it. Uh but again, there are there are some positive results that you can only get by tie breaking in a particular way. Like, like you have to fix some tie breaking rule in order to get that. Uh, I think we and and particularly with egalitarian welfare, I think and uh, if you look at some axioms, right, it can really only be satisfied uh if you if you like tie breaking is important uh, to satisfy some axioms. Um, but of course you can consider like, you know, um, because like, I mean, getting welfare, there's like this other like Lexi min kind of mechanism, right? That breaks ties in a particular way for like, even within egalitarian welfare. Um, so, so, I mean, in our result, we show that in any, you can break ties in any way and none of those uh, would, would be mechanisms that satisfy, that, you know, get any of these outcomes uh, would, would satisfy that. So, um, but you, yeah, I guess what you could consider like, you know, a more relaxed version of egalitarian, like, uh, like I think what Nisak said in the chat, right, egal one or something like that. Um, but yeah. Okay, what about Thanks. proportionality or something like if it's possible to have non-zero egalitarian welfare, then you must have egalitarian welfare non-zero. Uh, sorry, so what's the, the last? Uh, okay, proportionality maybe is the most simple Thing. Do you have a strategy yeah, 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 yeah. result for that? Yeah, uh, I think we also showed that you cannot approximate egalitarian welfare 
um, you know, any proofful mechanisms cannot obtain any like approximation for egalitarian welfare. Any finite approximation? Yeah. Oh, so uh, I guess basically it's just um because it's very easy for someone to just uh misrepresent they have hardships in like time steps they don't they like all the projects and because of that then the egalitarian welfare from possibly you can achieve one it becomes zero because some agents can manipulate that way. Okay, thank you. Dominic, that answers your question about zero versus non-zero. Yeah. All right. Uh, Errol, you have the next question. Uh, is your question, there's already a response to it. Are you satisfied or do you uh, want to ask something more? Uh, yeah, yeah, yes. I'm uh, just trying to understand. I'm somewhat confused by, by, among the different models for temporal voting. So yep. I'll be happy if, uh, if you can uh, make some order. How, how is it related to other models? So one, one of them you already answered, but um, maybe there are other models. That you right you sent a paper um a link right what what's that which paper is that um so this is mind. a paper about uh it's a paper by uh, amanatidis barot uh, lang markakis and dryas it's about uh, uh, multiple referenda so in each uh, in each uh, time step you have only one topic which you can vote for or against it's like your model but only one candidate in each round yeah yep, yep. so right so there are many works in this area uh with under many different mm -hmm. names, um, perpetual voting, sequential decision yes. making, committee elections with like where you say yes, yes, a, a public yes, decision making, public goods, whatever, uh, scheduling, yeah, all, all these. I think uh, there there are slight variant uh, sort of yes. variants of of these. You know where depending on how many candidates you pick at each time step, uh, what preferences are like, are there constraints on preferences across time steps? Um, but if you look at this paper, uh, then yes. uh, we'll we'll like this paper, this survey paper uh, looks at the differences between all these and puts it in one framework where you can see the, I guess the different uh, elements you mean of, that, a, of this. You mean uh, temporal fairness in multi winner yeah, voting? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I okay, mean, okay, you okay, think good. about like allocating basically like public goods, right? Or referenda, like, you know, at each step you select something um, it's similar to voting for a candidate as well. Yes. Um, that, this, I think, draws some link between, you know, fair allocation when goods can be shared and like voting mm -hmm. uh, in a sequential sense. What is what is the importance of the temporal aspect here? Why not just treat all all this as uh, just uh, multi multiple issues? Each day yeah. is a different issue. And, uh, so it's... so in this case, um, yeah, in in our case, um, you can I mean time steps are sort of independent, right? Like they they can be reordered. Um, but we could also consider, and we have actually considered. I mean, in the submitted work, uh, where where it's the the order matters because uh, we may mm. you know want to we don't want to you know like um give to a too small a group of people too much utility in initially right in case something happens sometime you know in the future mm. and and this thing has to stop we cannot guarantee the remaining agents um any utility anymore right just in case okay 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 so okay. so, so, so you, have, you have a plan you you are going to execute this plan so for example if our holiday is going to be like five days right i'm i'm, I'm or like mm. okay the purpose is going to be like five days i'm going to select meals uh, but you know like something happens and like half the con uh, mm -hmm. our trip is cut short and like, you know, you can't satisfy people. Um, so, so we might want to still get some, you know, uh, sort of fairness in between, right? Uh, so we have fairness between. also in every prefix of the Something like that, yeah. Example. That's the okay. strongest version, but yeah, exactly. Okay, uh, it, it, it's a very nice slide because it shows where the confusion comes from. So many different uh, <laughs> names. Yeah, yeah, there are many, many. <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, Thanks. Dominic, you have a question about fractional outcomes? Yeah, so one thing one could do is in each time step, instead of choosing one thing, you choose a lottery over the projects. Right. And then presumably many computational problems at least become linear programs or convex programs and become easier. Right, yeah. I suppose one could also consider like a temporal version of portioning, right? If you think of the outcome of portioning as like a lottery over outcomes, but some distribution, uh, yeah. But you can't say whether any other of your results still hold or would break. No, we haven't looked at it. No. Thank you. All right. Uh, anybody else wants to ask any question? If not, then let's thank the speaker once more. Thanks. All right, and then Dominic will do his magic and uh, put us in the breakout rooms.
for our second seminar, uh, which is by Jamie Tucker Forts, and he's gonna talk to us about monotone uh, randomized apportionment. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, my name is Jamie Tucker Fultz. Thank you all for and thank you organizers for inviting me. Um, and this this paper I'm going to be presenting is joint work with Jose Correa, Paul Goles, Ulrike Schmidt Kreplin, and Victor Verdugo. Um, I don't see the chat in this view, so um, and I I really do want to encourage discussion and questions throughout. So please, just like anyone, unmute yourself uh, if you have any anything you want to say at any time. I'm very happy to take that. So yeah, our paper is about uh, apportionment. Uh, if you've not heard of this problem before, here's a, a brief intro. It's a very simple problem. Uh, you're just given a list of positive real numbers and you have to round them to integers while preserving the sum of all the numbers. Notable application of this is determining how many seats in the United States House of Representatives each state gets in the, how many, how many seats each state gets in the United States House of Representatives um, based on its population. Um, so we want these to be proportional to the populations. Um, or in a, many European or parliamentary democracies, um, apportionment is used to determine how many seats each party gets in the legislature. So these are systems where voters vote for parties rather than candidates. Um, and then you want to apportion the number of seats in, in, in the legislature proportional to the party shares of each party. Um, and so, so just to give like a, a concrete example of this, and, and, and I might lapse between calling these things parties or states, uh, depends on, on your, what, what democracies you're familiar with. This is, this is a, a different language. I'm going to try to stick with parties, but if I say states by accident, I mean, I mean parties. Um, I'll try to use a party language. So here, here's an example. Uh, suppose we have a very small country and it's got a legislature that just has 11 seats. Okay, that, that's the whole legislature. Uh, and we have an election where here are the, the, the votes. So people vote for one of there's six different political parties and 110 people voted for party one, 270 people voted for party two. Okay, this is it. Very small country, only, only, only about a thousand people. Uh, and so I'm just plotting the, the, the number of votes for each party and the um in, in, the, in this in this bar chart here okay uh so how do we assign these 11 seats to the parties based on their party shares um well the, the first uh thing we can do is i'm going to define the party share to be the number of votes that that party received divided by the total population so that's a number between zero and one and then i scale that up by multiplying by the target house size which in this case is 11. this is going to be a big running example throughout this talk okay and so by definition then these party shares are numbers that sum to the target house size and are proportional to the populations. Okay, so the sum of all these numbers is 11. And so this is like how many seats each party deserves in parliament. Um, and so if these all happen to be integers, then we're done. We should just give each party that many seats. Um, and that, that's obviously the right thing to do. Um, but of course, they're not going to be integers. So we have to determine who gets rounded up, who gets rounded down. So that's, that's the apportionment problem. So we're going to take as a non-negotiable axiom um, the quota axiom, which says each party should either be rounded up or down to the nearest integer, not more than that. Okay, so in other words, each party I should get either QI floor, which is called their lower quota, or QI ceiling, which is called their upper quota. And so this, you know, 2.7, I shouldn't be rounding that up all the way up to four. It's either going to get two or three seats. Okay, so let's 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 start by assigning each party their lower quota number of seats. We know we have to do at least that many. Okay, so that, that gives out eight of the 11 seats which means um, there's there's three remaining that we have to assign. And the idea is we're going to give some of these parties one extra seat. Okay, and, and, and we want to add three more seats total because the total house size is 11. Um, and for that, we need to look at the residues, um, which are these numbers after the decimal point. The residue of party I is its quota, is its party share minus its lower quota. And so based on how we've defined things, uh, these, these residues are all going to sum up to an integer K, which is the number of remaining seats. Okay, that's just but by definition because the party shares summed up to eleven. These and and the the lower quote is summed up to eight. The party shares therefore sum up to three. Okay, so we've got and in general we've got n numbers and they sum to some integer k less than n and we have to determine which set to round up. Okay, so 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 who gets rounded up? Um, a ob obvious thing you might suggest is just look at who has the highest residue. Those look like the most deserving. Okay, and so so we see there's a 0.7, a 0.7, and a 0.8. Maybe those three parties should get the three extra seats because uh, they have the highest residues. And so this policy is known as Hamilton's method. It was proposed by Alexander Hamilton for solving the United States House of Representatives apportionment problem. Um, it was it was used once in, in U.S. history, but it's currently not the system that the U.S. uses. Um, and but it's very intuitively fair. 
Um, it satisfies the quote axiom. Um, and the unlike the current one that the U.S. uses, by the way, fun fact. Um, but um, you know, there's it's still a bit unfair. There's still winners and losers. It's it, you know maybe there's a difference between 0.6 and 0.7 wasn't too great, and you know that it, it still has some some bits of unfairness in it. Um, and in particular, there there's there's some you know paradoxes that that happen with with when you when you run, run a rule like this. Um, and, and so a particular one that's very famous is the so-called population paradox, where we imagine rerunning the election um, with a different 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 voter turnout. Now, now party one got 150 votes instead of 110. So they got 40 more votes. Um, and I, you, know, you just have to trust me on the, the, the numbers and the math here. Um, but if you compare these two elections side by side, you see what happens is that party four got fewer votes but gained a seat, whereas party six got more votes and lost a seat. Okay, so that, that's that's a sort of paradox. And, and formally, this this violates an axiom that's called population monotonicity. So the Hamilton's method suffers from this, this paradox. It does not satisfy this, this population monotonicity axiom. Um, and there's a very famous impossibility result by Belinsky and Young that says that any deterministic apportionment method that satisfies the quote axiom fails the population monotonicity. Okay, so... There's, there's a lot of problems with deterministic rules. And obviously, if you saw the talk title, we're going to solve this with randomness. Okay, so how, how what, what what would that look like? What would the ideal world look like? And and I claim this is like what we want. We, we want the following axiom. Each party is round, I is rounded up with probability exactly equal to its residue. Okay, so if we can get that property, that implies that uh, is a sort of best best of both worlds fairness guarantee. Because ex ante, the number of seats a party gets in the expectation is exactly equal to its party share. Okay, and and ex post, they're still getting up their party share plus or minus one. They're either rounded down to their lower quota, or up to their upper quota, and so 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 ex ante, you get exactly what you deserve, and ex post, you get what you deserve up to one, which is obviously the best you could possibly hope for. Okay, so this this is this is like the gold standard of of, of fairness for for randomized apportionment rules, and one way you could achieve this is to just independently round up or down each party i with probability pi. Okay. Um and and so that that'll satisfy these properties. Um but the the problem then is that you don't necessarily get the right house size in that. You're going to have some variance in the, the total house size. And so the the thought then is what if we correlate the roundings so that when we round one party up we round some other party down um and in the end we guarantee a fixed house size. So it's it's, it's not entirely clear this is possible to do at all. Um, but in fact, this was shown that yes, this is true. And so and specifically, a, a paper in 2014 by Joffrey Grimmett um, proposed this mechanism specifically in, the, in the, the context of this apportionment problem and said, okay, here's how to do it. So so what Grimmett said, this is Grimmett's rule, is we, again, just assign the lower quotas, not touching those. We take the residues and line them up in the arbitrary order they were given on the number line. Um, and these residues sum to, to, to k, k equals three in this example. So this occupies a space on the number line between zero and three. Okay, then we're going to uniformly shift all these blocks on the number line by some random number between zero and one. Okay, so suppose it's this shift, this little tiny black rectangle. Then I see where the blocks intersect the integer tick marks on the number line and round up those corresponding parties. So in this case, it's parties uh, four, five, and six that each get an extra seat. Those are the ones that cross these integer tick marks. And so this is just one draw of Grimmett's algorithm. It happens only if the shift is between zero and 0.1 in this example. Uh, if we had a slightly larger shift, um, then suddenly we see that it's parties um, three, five, and six that get the extra seat. Um, so and, and that also happens probably 0.1. I've gone and calculated all the probabilities of the various shifts and who, what set, what's, what co, what sets of parties get those three extra seats. So each one of these columns is one possible realization from Grimmett's algorithm. And so, so you know, because there, there's, this has a lot of nice properties, right? Because there's exactly three tick marks, every column is going to have exactly three parties. Uh, we're always going to have the right total house size. Um, and if you look at each party, the probability that it gets rounded up is exactly equal to its residue. And that's not hard to prove based on how, because the shift is added to it. No matter where it starts in the lineup, it's shifted by some uniform amount between zero and one, its probability of being selected is exactly equal to its residue. Okay, um, so so this is great. Um, it satisfies the, all these axioms I wanted. This is going to be, you know, monotone in any sense you you want to talk about, um, like like the at least in, from a probabilistic point of view, like your your expected number of seats is literally equal to your party share. So if you think about like a 
a probabilistic version of monotonicity. Obviously, it satisfies that, satisfies proportionality ex ante, quota ex post. Really, what more could we ask for is sort of closes the book on what what we can do with randomized apportionment, right? This is, you know, we, we, we've done it. We've, we've, we've satisfied all the axioms we want. Um, and so this was 20 years ago. Um, and the and our paper seeks to reopen this book and say, actually, there are many different ways besides Grimmett's kind of ad hoc mechanism that I just described um, that, that can satisfy all these properties. And some of them are better than others. And in particular, the issue we draw with Grimmett's mechanism is that there's bizarre correlations between the probabilities of certain parties being rounded up. Um, so for example, like parties one and two, you can see they never appear in the same column together with these extra seats. Um, so they're never rounded up together versus you know parties uh, two and four are very often rounded up together. Okay, so that that's kind of funny. Um, and and specifically, these, these, these sort of joint events about multiple parties being rounded up could matter a whole lot if these parties want to form coalitions with each other. And so that and so that this um this this is what uh, motivates that are our, our, these we want to sort of introduce new axioms about the space of uh, randomized apportionment rules to refine which is the best and we're going to do it in, in with this idea of minimizing bizarre correlations between joint events um, and specifically so consider the following scenario uh, suppose that parties one three and five in this example are left leaning parties we'll color them in blue and parties two four and six are right leaning parties we'll color them in red. Okay, and so there's 11 seats in the in the legislature, and so a, what a, what a, either this blue coalition or the red coalition might really care about is who can have a majority of six out of the 11 seats. Uh, and if you look at how in this specific example, based on just the lower quotas, I've given out three of the seats for sure to the blue parties and five of the seats for sure to the red parties, and so there's three remaining. So it's it's up for grabs. Anyone's guess who's going to control a uh, parliament. But in fact, in this example, it's not up for grabs, because if you look at the columns of all the possible outcomes of Grimmett's mechanism, there's no column where I see three blue parties. Um, so in fact, there's a probability zero of a blue government. Okay, now let's imagine things change a bit. We rerun the election, and now we have uh, different vote shares, different party shares. Um, and specifically, consider a shift where I increase weekly increase the party shares of all the red parties and weekly decrease all the party shares of the blue parties. Okay, so this is this should only help the red parties, right? Where more votes, more more vote share towards the red parties, less vote share towards the blue parties. Um, however, now if I run Grimmett's algorithm, the residues line up in this nice repeating pattern. And in fact, uh, now it's possible there is some shift that gives the blue parties, all three of them will might be rounded up with probably 0.1. I'll get a shift between 0.9 and 1. Um, and so this this is a sort of paradox, right? We've gone from a situation where I, I had a shift away from blue parties towards red parties, um, but the probability of a blue government increased from zero to 0.1. Okay, so this 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 is really our our, our definition. I'll, I'll formally state it on the next slide, but this is the sort of paradox we we seek to avoid. Um, any any questions so far before I move on about this example or our definition? Okay, so um, formally, um, we're going to call a rounding rule a map that takes as input a residue profile. So this is uh, there's there's n parties total. Um, the residues are each numbers between zero and one, and they sum to some integer k. And so all this is parameterized by uh, fixed numbers n and, and k, um, and then we have to output a distribution over sets of size k subsets between of the numbers between one and n. So our uh, our again non-negotiable axiom that we're going to take is that this must satisfy ex ante proportionality. The probability that i is included in the the random set uh, is exactly equal to the residue of party i p i, um, and that you know so the quota axiom is sort of also baked into this uh, definition because all we're saying is we do satisfy lower quotas and the rounding rule just selects who gets the extra ones. So so that th those are all things we we have for sure. Okay, and then so the, the 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 really the new axiom that that is about this sort of monotonicity issue, uh, we call selection monotonicity, which says that if we have some coalition of parties T, and we have some change from a residue profile P to a residue profile P prime, where for all the parties inside T I increased the residue, and for all the parties outside of T I decreased the residue, then the probability of selecting that set T should weakly increase. 
Okay, so this is exactly what was just violated on the previous slide, where we had the coalition T of parties one, three, and five. Okay, so um, the, yeah, so previous example, Grimmett's method is not selection monotone. So can we come up with a new method that is selection monotone? Um, and in fact, while Grimmett's method was the only one that's been like specifically proposed and analyzed in this apportionment setting, there's actually a substantial literature in both the computer science and statistics uh, worlds on uh, dependent rounding rules. So these go by different names. Um, and here's a, a reference on, on the slide if you want to see a specific um, survey for um, applications to approximation algorithms. But there's there are a bunch of these rules. They're like, we found like this one really old survey paper that just had like something like 50 rules. And we, we just started like looking at them all. Do any of them satisfy this property? Um, and so surprisingly, like none of them seem to satisfy this property. Um, and, uh, and I want to tell you about uh, two rules and specifically because it's sort of a fun story. Um, so this this is like one of the earliest ones we, we thought would, would be a really strong candidate um, is we run, we're, we're essentially trying to minimize correlations, right? Um, and so can we select the distribution over sets of size K that has the maximum entropy, lowest correlations? Um, and th this, this is a rule that goes by the name of conditional Poisson rounding. And what it amounts to is finding values pi one through pi n um, such that we can then select each uh, set of size k with probability equal to the product of all these values. Okay, um, so so th this this is this is how you maximize entropy. Fun facts are um, like okay, so how do you choose these pi values based on p values? Well, there's there's n variables and there's n constraints, right? Because you, you have a proportionality constraint for each for each party. Um, and so you might think, oh, we just solve the system. Um, and in fact, this is this is just a mathematical fact. This is always true. There always exists some pi values satisfying the proportionality constraints, uh, and they're uniquely determined by pi. So there's a one-to-one -one mapping between the, the 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 residues and these pi values, which are called the working probabilities. And so once you and once you do that, um, it turns out that the this this rule selects the distribution over sets of size k that has the maximum entropy over all distributions of sets of size k. Okay, so um, so it's a very nice rule. There's, there's, there's a lot that's known about it, and we thought this is a really good contender to uh, you know eliminate these bizarre correlations. Um, and and we did a bunch of fancy math, and and with the help of Mathematica, uh, for n equals six and k equals three, which is this first case where Grimm breaks, Mathematica told us that selection monotonicity holds if and only if the following expression is always positive. Okay, and what's the expression? You've already seen it. It was on the background of my title slide. This is the expression. Um, and so, and the, you know, the, there's there's six variables, P0 through P5, um, and all of these monomials have degree 12. And if you look closely, they're, they're just all plus signs. So we're good. Okay, it's proof by font being too small to read. Um, but uh, unfortunately, if you stare really hard at this, you can see there's actually one minus sign in this entire expression. Um, so th this was, yeah, I, I love telling the story. It was really spooky when the, when this happened. Like literally, this whole thing, all positive monomials, except there's one minus sign. And we have to prove this whole thing is positive. And in fact, there is a monomial order in which this term dominates. Um, so in fact, there was a counterexample. Um, and, and and conditional Poisson rounding does not satisfy selection monotonicity. And this is the example. This is, after a lot of work, this was the simplest possible counterexample to conditional Poisson rounding not satisfying selection monotonicity. These are the residues. And we found some tiny perturbation that, that changed the probability of selecting one, two, three on the order of 10 to the minus 26 in a non-monotone way. Okay, so we were we were very disturbed when, when we found this. Um, yes. Excuse me. I uh, just wanted to say that we are uh, reaching close to the end of the time. Would you be able to wrap up in a few minutes? Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm taking too long, probably. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I really don't have much more to say. Okay. Um, I thought I have, I thought I have like five more minutes. Uh, yeah, like, I think we started like uh, at uh, 44 past the hour yeah. and it's 20 okay. minutes. So yeah. Here, here's, here's the thing that works. Samford rounding. Um. And I and it's a distribution over sets of size k defined with the following sampling algorithm. So I sample k parties with replacement. The first one I select with probabilities proportional to pi. Okay, um, so probabilities proportional to the residues. Put that back, write that down, put it back in the bag. And then I draw each subsequent party proportional to pi over one minus pi. So different probability distribution for all the others. Um, and this is with replacement. So I might have a collision. I might draw the same party twice. If that happens, I restart the whole process. 
So I do this over and over until I get a distinct set of parties. Um, and it's very unclear the satisfies proportionality, right? There's this rejection, there's these weird probabilities going around. Um, but yes, this does satisfy proportionality. Um, and our main result is that this additionally satisfies our axiom of selection monotonous. Okay, so and I'm not going to say anything about the proof of this, but uh, the main takeaway from our paper is if you want to use the randomized apportionment for your up and coming democracy, don't just use uh, Grimmett's method because it was the first one proposed. Uh, Samford rounding satisfies all the properties that Grimmett satisfies and more. Also, this is eliminating these bizarre correlations. Um, and okay, so the last thing I want to mention is some stronger axioms um, than than selection monotonicity. Because selection monotonicity is really just about this process of the residues determining who gets rounded up, that process being monotone. Um, but in fact, you might care about the more end-to-end -end process of how the total number of seats and specifically whether you reach like a majority in parliament depends on the vote shares. And so that's a stronger axiom. And the, that, that process is monotone. And we call that threshold monotonicity. It says that for any threshold M, if the shares of parties in T increase and the shares of party outside T decrease, and the probability of T controlling at least M seats weekly increases. Okay, so this is, this is a strictly stronger notion. And selection monotonicity was like the counterexample that Grimmett's rule violated, I showed you earlier. But threshold monotonicity really encapsulates the whole full range of weird paradoxes that you'd want to outlaw. Um, and so, so we think that's, you know, the the the, the really the, the thing we'd like to move towards proving. Um, and then finally, you can have an even stronger property, which is that it's monotone not in the vote shares, but the raw numbers of votes. Um, and that's even stronger. And that's equivalent to um, threshold monotonicity, even when the total ver voter turnout changes. It's, it's good. It's kind of it's kind of like even if there's more or less voters then like I want it. It's, it's, a, it's a much stronger property. And so our basic results is that, um, yeah, we we have we know that Sanford satisfies selection monotonicity. We do not have a proof that satisfies threshold monotonicity. This is a really great open question that we, we hope to work on in future work. Um, and the, um, the, the only positive result we do have about threshold monotonicity is that Grimmett's rule does satisfy it, but only for coalitions of size at most two. Um, and as we've seen for coalitions of size three, it doesn't even satisfy the weaker selection monotonicity axiom. Uh, as for vote count threshold monotonicity, uh, we actually have an impossibility result that there is no method that satisfies that along with other non-negotiable axioms of ex ante proportionality and quota. Okay, so that's that. That's all our results. There, are, this is my my last slide. I promise. Um, the in our paper we also had um, we also have a bunch of other things I didn't have time to talk about, which are we there the original axiom of population monotonicity had this like sort of pairwise flavor where we talk about like like you know one state goes gets more votes and receives fewer seats, and the other gets fewer votes and receives more seats. So we have a versions of our of our coalitional monotonicity axioms. For in that sort of flavor as well. And we have a whole parallel set of results for those, um, both positive and impossibility results that I didn't talk about. We also have a proof that selection monotonicity implies Lipschitz continuity, which is a nice thing. You might also want continuity in the prob selection probabilities. Um, and then we also have another counterexample for uh, a rule called pipage rounding. Um, the, yeah, and so all, all our results are just summarized in this table here. We have an impossibility result that no rule can satisfy vote count threshold monotonicity. We have a positive result for Samford satisfying selection monotonicity. And the huge open question is whether there is a rule that satisfies threshold monotonicity. And we strongly would conjecture that Samford does satisfy it. Um, and this is really, you know, the biggest open question right now um, that we would like to solve. And then finally, to pose uh, one more question for you all um, is, you know, this, the, the whole motivation for this paper is how can we eliminate bizarre correlations between who gets rounded up? And in our paper, we took bizarre correlations to mean, you know, correlations that are non-monotone in these sort of joint events. Um, but really, are there other notions that we should be considering? Can we formalize other axioms that embody the spirit that are also, you know, a practical thing we'd want to use, mon random, mon to use randomized apportionment for? Okay, uh, sorry if I went a few minutes over time. Uh, happy to take any more questions. No worries at all. Uh, let's thank the speaker. All right. Uh, let me start with uh, the questions on the chat. Uh, I had a question about uh, why, I mean, it seemed at the time that somehow the, the allocation of the remaining seats are only dependent on the residues. And I was wondering why it, it should be like that, uh, at least in an ideal case. Uh, I mean, I can imagine like, 
uh, strictly and strongly preferring rounding up 10.70 to 11 over to uh, 1.71 to 2. Uh, so um, just because of the ratios, you know, and so so I don't know if you can elaborate on that. That's a really great point and something we didn't think about. Um, I, I, so I have two thoughts on that. The first is, um, yeah, there, so people do care about notions like this. Um, and the, the, the reason that the U.S. currently uses the Huntington Hill method um, to do its deterministic apportionment is motivated by these sorts of concerns. There's a, there's a nice theorem about that that has to do with um, looking at like the total, you know, uh, the, the, not not just the residue, but the the whole the the whole vote party share, right? Um, and so so yeah, that that that's very interesting, and I think definitely like could ask more questions about that. The one thing I'll say is why we didn't um, focus on that is that we're we're restricting ourselves to always satisfy the quota axiom. And so it felt kind of like natural to say, okay, given that we're going, like it's possible to always do randomized apportionment while satisfying the quota axiom. Um, now it seems like the only thing that the input to the problem feels like it just should be the residues. Um, so uh, yeah, the, like the, the, the these axioms about total party shares come more into play with like divider methods where that don't respect the quota axiom. But still, I agree that, that, that you could try to incorporate something like that. Um, but it's unclear how exactly, uh, because we're really always enforcing this ex ante proportionality anyway. So it kind of maybe makes it less of a concern, but like you are you are going to have to round down like the party with 0.7 with 0.7 vote share to zero sometimes to satisfy the axiom. So I'm just not I'm not clear like how what extent you can actually do something with that. Yeah. Uh Errol, you have a question? Yes, I, a question? I, I... I asked, uh, maybe it's, it's related to the previous question, I asked what happens if you do not require a lower quota, you only require proportionality, so the, the expected number of seats for each party should equal its, uh, its, its uh, fraction of votes. Well, then so, you can just independently round everything, and then there's no correlations whatsoever. Independently round? Sorry, no, oh, no quota. No. Okay, yes. Um, what happens if there's no quota? Um... I don't think that helps you very much because you could still consider the following case where um, say that all the party shares are between zero and one. Um, so so obviously you're not mm -hmm. going to be able to give anyone a negative um, party share. So, okay, so at least that, that would imply that um, saying there's no lower quota doesn't help you. Um, mm -hmm. Possibly saying there's no upper quota might um might might give you more power uh we haven't thought about that uh we did think about that once a, a long time ago um I, I, I don't think we had any results on it though okay so okay now uh, another question is if you consider instead of a lottery you consider a fractional seat you can for example think that uh, uh, you give a fractional seat to a party which means it's fractional voting power fractional salary uh so can you use the, uh, uh, does it make any sense in your, uh, in your model? Um, I'll, I'll note that, I mean, this, this is actually done in some cases. Um, mm -hmm. the, uh, in, in fact, uh, I, I was just working on another project a, a few weeks ago um, where there's a, there's a county in New York state that is, has a, a board of supervisors it's like some local thing with multiple with representatives from each town, and they wanted to give the towns fractional voting power based on their populations. Once oh, okay. representative each with different um, different voting powers, and uh, yeah, so I mean, it's if if you just want those to be proportional populations, it's not too interesting of a problem. You don't really have any rounding to do at all, right? Ah, okay, okay. Um, so, so actually, it's it's very simple. You just give uh, the fractional seat, and that's all. Don't, uh... Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, if I could make a comment, uh, Schenectady yeah. did this a few years ago. Uh, they changed things to be uh, fractional votes. Um, and in terms of where the um, threshold for passage was, it made no difference at all in the voting rule, but it satisfied them. In other words, they might have as well all have had unweighted votes. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually. They um so so this project I was working on a few weeks ago. What what they really want to do now is they want to make weighted votes so that the bonds off power indices are proportional to the populations. 
that's been like accepted by courts mm. as a definition of fairness, surprisingly, and as, as a interesting computational problem of how you how you do that. Right. If we have uh, some time, maybe Sajan has one more question. Uh, are you able to unmute? It's a short question. I can also read out on your behalf. Uh, is apportionment property applicable to other types of voting environments uh, beyond party elections? Um, I mean, certainly dependent rounding is um, like this is randomized stuff is, is very important. Like, uh, you know, this naturally arises in like approximation algorithms where you have some LP when you need to round the variables and maybe you don't want to round them you want you want to round them randomly in some way, but you don't want it to be you know an extreme solution. So you want to correlate the roundings. Um. So so this is this is sort of the source of of this randomized apportionment um stuff. Uh, I don't know for deterministic apportionment. Um, yeah, I don't. I'm I'm not aware of any specific applications outside of elections. That's really the the main use case. I guess the monotonicity would would somehow have to make sense in that that setting yeah, yeah. yeah. um and yeah and we, and we tried to look into like whether our results about Samford rounding could be useful for anything else um not in the election context and, and we we do and if you look at our paper have a sort of hypothetical story about how this might be useful in a, in um in a sort of mechanism design setting where you need a monotonicity um to in, in the sense of like Meyerson's monotonicity um but uh yeah, it's 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 very um, sketchy whether this is actually useful or not. Right. Uh, There's a question by Jatin. Uh, Jatin, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Uh, let me just read out the question. Uh, he's asking about the natural kind of rule where you sample uh, uh, with probabilities proportional to the the shares uh, until and, and kind of repeat from scratch uh, till you get exactly k candidates. Uh, so that's probably not going to satisfy proportionality. Like Sam Samford, Samford rounding. You know that this process you we did this different probabilities so that it satisfies proportionality. And 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 like uh oh and when you were talking about uh, if you wanted to sample them like it's kind of actually like the conditional Poisson rounding um where that that's kind of like but and and there you have to sample with these totally weird proportional these weird pi values too um yeah so you so you, you have to like to to get this like the the fixed house size and proportionality you have to do something weird. You can't just like use a simple rule. I, I really think this, the, these two rules that I talked about, conditional Poisson and Samford are kind of the two simplest ways of doing this. Um, and along with, you know, Grimmitz is the most like sort of ad hoc way, but yeah. Yeah. And we have a last question from Dominic. I actually have two questions. So you have this example where the Poisson thing violates it uh, yeah. and it's massive numbers, especially the denominators are massive. Yes. So does the method by which you arrived here implies that if you have if your number of voters is less than the <laughs> common denominator of these numbers, then there's no paradox? Yeah, I, I believe it does. Um we've we've not systematically verified that, and it would take a lot of computational power to figure out what the actual bound is. But uh my intuition is strongly yes. Like this took so we had this like we found this like Mathematica issue, like way back in the early days, which was actually when Dominic was still on the project. Um, he eventually got fed up because of this counterexample and left. No, but, uh, Dominic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> but um, the um, and and then we never actually tried to like figure out this exact counterexample until like a day before the EC deadline, and then it was like three of us were intensely working for hours trying to actually write down this explicit counterexample. It was really hard to like back this out from from that proof, but we, we eventually got there. But yeah, it, it really is like a tiny, tiny, tiny counterexample. Second short question. So I think on the next slide, you said something towards the end that Samford sampling also has other nice properties, I guess, besides selection monotonicity. Did I hear you right? Um, yeah, yeah. It um, and in fact, there's there's an interesting like interpretation 
So, so it's got properties about like, first of all, um, like negative association, um, the things you'd want, like other sorts of notions of not being correlated. Um, and um, we also, in, in, in this paper, we, we sort of proved some interesting facts about Samford rounding that might be of independent interest. Uh, in particular, I'll show you uh, this, this slide, which is we actually like calculate, okay, like if you read Samford rounding, um, and, and write down what the what the probability is of selecting a given specific set um, t the it's it's this numerator and then divided by this crazy denominator because this is the normalization term it's proportional to this so we have to divide by the sum of all sets t prime of that numerator um, and the interesting fact so we can rearrange it and the interesting fact we proved is that there's actually an interpretation of this denominator in terms of the expected variance in, ter in terms of the the variance of a ran of a of, a, of this random variable where we just do things independently. Um, and so this lemma, we really can't explain. The, the, the proof is like a page um, and it has no intuition. Um, and this is sort of the key workhorse for proving all our theorems uh, about Samford. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I, I think Samford like is a really mathematically interesting rule is, is, is what I'll say. Thank you. All right, let's thank Jamie once again. So maybe it's not a question, but I just want to say I, I really enjoyed this talk. It was really well done and very interesting. So thank you. Thank you. All right, and before we depart, just one quick announcement. So the next seminar will be on the fourth Wednesday of November. So that would be November 27th as usual. But then the seminar after that in December, we don't want it to be on the fourth uh, Wednesday of December, which is on Christmas day. Uh, so we are going to uh, move it up one week earlier. So that would be on December 18th. All right, so that's it for today. And thank you all for coming.